Okay, so hi all a few two people who showed up here for our uh, workshop. Um, well, may, maybe just like introduce us for like ten yeah. seconds. Uh, so we're Jairish and I'm Anna, and uh, we work on Node Core, and uh, we are two of the people who try to answer questions in the Node.js slash help repository on GitHub. And so that is kind of the idea of this workshop here, trying to find people who might have issues with Node.js and um, help them get uh, get answers to their questions. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. So for me, uh, this is first of its kind event that's happening. So uh, please feel free to provide any feedback in terms of uh, the expectations, if it is not matching in terms of the content or in terms of uh, you know the details and things like that, we can always improve on that. But uh, for me, what is most important is for the Node.js ecosystem, we have a set of folks who are working on programs, who are end users, customers, who want to learn Node.js and things like that on one side. And then we have people who are on a daily basis working on the Node.js core, who are familiar with the APIs, who are defining the abstractions and looking at the gap in, in the abstractions, and who are familiar with the code at the API level, at the code level, at the design level, and even at the machine instruction level. So combining these two groups together, the whole idea is to make uh, having meaningful conversations and make the Node.js user experience a better one. So that's the whole idea. That's the whole intent. So in that in that perspective, uh, I think we are doing the right thing. So please feel to share the feedback if any. Right. Um, so yeah, since there's only like um, less than a handful of people here who attend, um, I would suggest that um, well, well, if you that, that we start by asking you, like, do you have any issues or any questions about Node.js that you brought with you that you want to ask? And don't be shy because you're not taking up anybody else's uh, talking time. <laughs> um, I, do you? Okay, I'm, I'm, so do you think that um, that is something that we could like discuss in like in a verbal form or do we need to look at your code or I'm just ha right. having this year uh, so you know verbal. it's for the recording. Well, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, then verbal. if you want to take this. I don't maybe. know if you guys can show anything on the screen or like do you have a browser you can go to things? Yeah, or? sure. Like I, you could open a browser, right? Feel like I'm in charge here now. So. <laughs> yeah, you kind of are, <laughs> because you've got the mic. <laughs> um, I currently have an application where it's passing the IDs through the URL address bar, and I don't really want that for a number of reasons. Right. So, like, as a as a like a parameter behind the question mark and everything. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't sound like something you'd usually want. No. <laughs> Security reasons and just ugliness. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I don't know who the person in this room with, like, the most express experience would be, but, um... Yeah, I guess it's not a Node.js specific question. Well, I mean, express is Node.js specific, but, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have the time to figure it out. Like, <laughs> actually, we do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um... I mean, like, for at least for me, it's like very unfortunate that I don't really get to do application development anymore. 
like I'm just working on node core. Um, so you want to you want to open some specific uh, GitHub issue or something? Uh, I don't have it uh, deployed online, but I have the code. Mm -hmm. Do you have the code somewhere online? Uh, yeah, I have it in GitHub actually. Yeah. As long as everybody doesn't make fun of my code. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we won't promise. Feel free to recommend other issue or other ways of doing anything, though. So. A uh, few basics I know of the session uh, module is that you have a session which is highly configurable, which you construct at the time of the program beginning, right. and then that returns a middleware which gets invoked in your route mm -hmm. before the actual user callback gets called. Right. And then you have a couple of APIs for the session, like save, uh, resave, and things like that. Right. And then you have the backend where the session gets stored, which is highly customizable. Yep. The databases and other other projects can implement their own uh, session stores. Session basically is an interface. Yep. And then we have seen few issues coming from the session repo in terms of uh, the session not getting persisted when you are redirecting the URL. And sometimes the session gets uh, deleted across the uh, routes. Okay. So. Yeah, it all makes sense in theory, but I guess I don't know. So, uh, I mean, which problem, which category your problem comes in? Is it like session not persisting or something like that? No, it, like he explained it, it's like the session is transferred as a parameter in the, like in the URL. Yeah. As a request parameter. Yeah, it's just and a like parameter it that be I passed. Cookie or through. something, right? What's that? It's a cookie, probably. It's yeah, I want to eliminate passing the ID in the address bar and use the session to contain that ID, so I can use it anywhere in the application. So I, I don't think the session ID is passed as part of the URL. No. Yeah, that's what I don't want to do. Okay. Yeah. I actually had a working semi-working solution where I set the, so I create the session in the application when it starts up. Mm -hmm. And I can get some pages working, but from the start to the end, I'm having problems with the flow. So are you using the ExpressJS session module? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the, like at their documentation and they basically only talk about cookies, but you seem to be familiar, more familiar with it anyway. But yeah, if you could share your code, maybe that would actually be a good starting point. Okay. Uh, let me see here what I have. It's not the right repository. I actually just rolled it back because I'm going to use it in a branch, but let me see here. Okay. Is there any way I can share this or you just want to look at my GitHub? Code base. You can spell it if you want. Yep, it's A D E N A D. Is that right? D E A U. And that's it. If you go there, you'll see my repositories. Yeah, that looks like you. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's not public right now. Just a minute here.
new refill public and it's not your refill? Uh, it's my project with the code in it and everything. No, no, sorry. Okay. That, that's the only public one that I have there right now. I'm trying to make this one public. If I spell it right, that would be better. Okay, should be another, that one right there, yeah. yeah. Okay, that looks like it has quite a bit of code. So if you go into the app uh, startup file. App.js? Yeah. You'll see if you scroll down a little bit. Yeah, there's express session, definitely. Yeah. And then down there, that's where a session is created. I copied that out of some example I found. So um, if you go to the user route in a different, if you go back up a level, back up, like back up in the repository. Oh, yeah, different. Uh, my routes in users. And if you scroll down to login. Right there. Uh, is there anything down below? Okay, so there I'm trying to set the is if the passwords match the log the user in and put their session as the user ID. So then I go to the other the profile page it's called and uh, right now if when it works I have the URL or the ID on the end of the profile um, folder there for where the redirect is going. It's actually not a redirect, it's a it's just a response and it sends it to that page or it responds and sends the, the uh, forwards onto the actual JavaScript that's on the page, jQuery. So that's it. Um. Okay, so, so it's just a wild guess, and you might correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but in the session uh, setup code, you had, like, like in the, uh, w in the call to what uh, express-session returned, yeah. um, there was, like, a key option that was set that I'm not finding in the documentation, and that kind of sounds like that, you know, might be. Um, in the, when I created the session, or when, um, when you're setting up the session middleware yeah. uh, in, in the app.js, I think that like I, 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 like the first thing I would try is deleting that line, maybe seeing what happens. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, right. There's this key user SID thing, and uh, I like I can't find that in the documentation. I don't know if this like where that comes from, but okay. is that what the like does this user SID thing show up in your URL? No. Okay. I may have put that in after I. I may have changed that. Let me look back at a different yeah. a previous version. So just for my understanding, is the problem you are describing is the session value which you saved in the dash profile route is not visible in the second redirect? Is, is that the problem statement? Yes. The when I go to the profile um, route, I guess you could call it down in the down further. Okay. I don't know, maybe I'm just halfway through it. I kind of am confused. <laughs> so ideally, the session object gets persisted between the redirects. Right. But we have seen many issues on that line. Uh, one, one known issue, 
which is related to some race condition is that suppose a scenario where you have a session store which is a remote machine like a MongoDB or whatever which is across the network and then the contract with the session API is that every time you send the response back to the client that is the time the session gets stored automatically to the session store. Now the response go to the client, the session go to the session store right these are two separate network requests. Now what if the client comes back with the second request immediately meaning back to back uh, second request which assumes that your session is already persisted and is available in the server in its modified form. Huh? But then there is a round trip network latency that is involved mm -hmm. and the depends on the proximity of the session store with respect to the client machine and all other network latency complexities involved. Right. It is so possible that the session is not really stored into the session store and when the client comes back for the second time you actually get the old value of the session. Right. Okay. So, I have tested it on a few pages and it is storing the ID in the session. Okay. So, I do you have an, a working example or maybe we could pull one up online? Uh, let me see. So, uh, the best practice around uh, working with the session stores yes. which are remote as opposed to a memory store is to explicitly save the session like session.save mm -hmm. and then um, send the response to the client only in the callback of the session method. So, that when the callback is triggered <coughs> you are guaranteed that the session is actually persisted in the store. Right. Let yeah. me see if I can figure okay. out a uh, find an example. Yeah, that, that might actually be very helpful. I don't know if this would be appropriate to ask here, but um, like maybe once we're done with this or at another point, would you guys be able to answer any questions around like just a brief what's happening with um, ESM modules? Like I know that they just yeah. got removed from the flag, but I'm basically confused about what the future of ESM and Node and what you know how all that's going to work. Or yeah, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, like. I, I can definitely give some kind of update. Yeah, just any um, color. I mean, I I don't. Yeah. I, I'm just curious if you guys have any. That's a question that like I, I confuses a lot of my friends, and yeah. I feel like I understand what's happening, but I don't. Yeah. I don't think I do very well. <laughs> so, like for the TC panel tomorrow, like uh, we did practice runs, and like we actually kind of are with at like five to ten minutes um, question time from the audience, and like. I, I feel like ESM might deserve a bit more. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So here is an example code for your reference. I can uh, walk you through this. First, let's look at the client side. There's the client side code uh, in the app dot listen callback. I start one client which is accessing the main route. And in the callback of the first request, I am making a second request. So, just to make sure that both the requests get the proper session object reflected in the. Now, if you look at the server code, you create a session here when no un, uh, save uninitialized <coughs> is set to yeah. false, resave is set to false, and the max age of uh, one minute. The default route. I create a session object and set the views to some value and then uh, send the response. But if it is not the default case, that is not for the first time, I increment the session and add some extra value to the session. This is only done in the second time onwards. And instead of uh, 
simply redirecting to the next route which is here I do it uh, basically I do an explicit save and then in the callback I do the redirection at this point line number 29 it's guaranteed that whatever the session store implementation is a database or memory store or whatsoever at this point the session is actually persisted so then when you actually land upon the admin route you actually get the latest value so maybe something you can try this yeah. but, but like so so maybe just to clarify like is the issue that the session key shows up in the URL or is it that you know the session is not always persisted I don't have an issue I just it's not showing up well, that's how I have it set up now because I was I was okay. new to Node and I just was passing IDs and now afterwards I wanted to go back and update it to use a session. Okay. So I'm halfway through that though. I just wanted to see like an example of how you guys would accomplish it and the best way to do that, the most efficient way. Right. Cool. <laughs> but that makes sense. I just. Uh, maybe I just need to put more time into it. So one of the other thing you can do is enable the debug mode. So right now if you run say the program mm -hmm. it just runs like this but if you say export debug is equal to express session I guess. Um, probably we need to get the client as well. 12,000. Yeah, so as you can see, um, most of the Express modules, including the session, have a lot of uh, debug statements sprinkled yeah. across the you know vital control flow points. That means to say the life cycle of the session, when it is getting persisted, when it is recreated, and things like that. So they, they print a very useful debug message. So the only thing you need to do is before starting, just export this. Right, yeah. And you get uh, very good information. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that gives me some information to go with. So yeah, sure. appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Um. <clears throat> Okay, does that mean like you want to like see if that helps you and maybe later we can come back to you if it doesn't? Or I'll try something after the session and if I have any issues maybe I can find you guys. Yeah, you can. You can also open issues on the GitHub Node.js slash help repository. Okay. Yep. That's the inspiration for this kind of thing here and like you can ask any question there if you have any. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so about ES module. <laughs> um, so my current understanding. So like the feature is still considered experimental, but the flag has been removed. Um, there are still experimental flags for some sub features. Um, like I think like the, the VM part, like the, in the VM module of Node.js, the part that is uh, concerned with modules, or I think the loader is still experimental too, like the loader API. Um, what, um, so like for, for the hard issues, I don't think there have been any like real bam, super good solutions. Like you, um, at this moment you cannot require ES modules from CommonJS. Uh, somebody opened a PR yesterday that would do that, but that basically wouldn't work in, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it would, like requires some very hacky things that you should generally not do in Node.js. And um, yeah, so so that's tricky. Like it, it partially because of uh, ESM supporting things like top level of weight. Uh, you know, like, like ESM sync execution can be asynchronous and um, well, well, it requires synchronous and that kind of just doesn't match up. And that PR kind of like hacks around that in some ways that you should not do. The other way around, like re uh, importing common JS from ES module, that works but only for the default export. 
and um, there are some like I don't think there's a really good way around that right now. Um, I think the the most um, <laughs> like the solution that the modules team is going for, as I understand it, is uh, for now that you can create some kind of wrapper module that is an ESM and that loads that common JS file and then re-exports everything. Um, which, you know, it, it, I guess that works well enough. Uh, there are some uh, features being added to package.json that are very relevant here. Uh, so you can, so for one, there's a type flag that can be set to module or, I, I, I don't know, I guess something else, <laughs> not module. And the type flag would tell you that like if it is type module, then .js file are going to be interpreted as ESM. So like that, that is the solution for not having to use .mjs. Uh, again, as I understand it, I'm not part of the module team. I just like uh, try to observe what they do and have strong opinions about that that I try to not uh, express because that gets frustrating. Um, I don't know what what else is there with the ESM. So, um, so, so to frame it, because um, you know a lot of people are really used to using, um, well, so for example, like create React app. Obviously, you get to use import export syntax currently, but yeah. that's because it's being transpiled by yeah. Babel and Webpack. Um, so I find a lot of people are confused when I tell them that like no Node doesn't support e import export syntax, aka ESM currently. So the effort that the module team is working on, that's specifically to get native support in Node.js of yes. ESM without requiring transpilation, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's fair to say that. There's yeah. currently experimental support, experimental which is support. why there's been a flag, et cetera. That's yeah. It started with a flag. The flag was because with other experimental pieces of discovery, people don't use it. So now oh. it's like a sort of a, we usually have a two step yeah. game flag, which has a small number of So do you know much about um, what Babel is doing in terms of, you know, it looks like we're using ESM currently, but I assume that, because I can, I can import uh, common JS modules, yeah. it's just, it's doing a transpilation in the background, et cetera. Um, so we're not, we're not currently even using real ESM. Like, are people publishing ESM? Is there a standard that we've agreed on for MJS currently? Or is that, is that all the so work that's would, happening? There, yeah, it's all work, I would say, there's a lot of stuff that's been agreed upon, and there's a lot of stuff that's been agreed upon. Hard, it's hard to find what's going on. However, there's only one person to ask about that stuff, so it's here. Um, yeah. No, yeah, but like more specifically to your question, like, like my understanding is that Babel does support ESM, um, like in a spec compliant way, but the spec leaves some options open for what the implementation does. And so the, yeah, one of the main issues and that I'm really unhappy about that we didn't find a solution so far, at least not that everybody's happy with, is that the, what Babel does and what Node currently does are not compatible. Like you don't have named imports from CommonJS, for example. Um, and, and I think in terms of what Babel actually does, I think it transpiles to something that essentially is require and then works on top of that. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think it does. Again, again, like you can probably know. Yeah. But my impression is Babel compiles to something that's very close to spec compliance. Spec without support yet. Two or hundred. But okay. I don't actually have that. And there's actually two or three other things. Well, yeah. I think there's also like a talk on the topic. Like yeah. Gus, you mean? Gus. Or and Guy. Gus, Gus and Guy. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that it, it is complicated and it is being worked on because it's that's what it's felt like to me so far is that it's it's you know, I, I don't fully grasp it. Um, so, so we're five minutes over just so you know. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we we're not. So we have until 11.30. No, the the session has time till twelve fifty. Twelve fifty, actually. We have two hours. Oh, okay. Like the the mobile version of the schedule is very confusing, but yes. because it doesn't show oh. you the times of the talks, oh, just when they start. Oh, terrible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We have tons of time. Tons of time. <laughs> Keep going. Um, no, that's cool. I just I I'm happy to like I said to talk to you guys about it. I'll I'll track down Miles and I'll maybe ask the TSC panel, yeah. but. Yeah. As like, oh, okay. as a consumer of you know at, of Node.js, um, this has been really confusing to me, uh, in terms of like whether what I'm going to have to end up doing in order to change my the JavaScript I write or if I need to. <laughs> but it sounds like, as of today, we're can still using Babel, etc. But the yeah. module group is working hard to uh, smooth out issues so that we can use it natively sometimes. Soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so like I looked it up. The talk is tomorrow at 3:40 p.m. Um, Miles is giving it, and it's about. Yes, modules. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I, I hope this was helpful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, I think so. <laughs> I'm. I'm still Anna. <laughs> yeah. 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 We've definitely met before. Going yeah. Here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Sorry. I mean, this so like the schedule says this one has time until twelve fifty. Um, <laughs> but like I, I mean, like depending on what we end up doing here, we might cut it early. I guess. Okay. Yeah. So this is your code. Did you share? Oh, yeah, right. Okay. A any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, if you have any other questions about how Node.js works, like, this would be the time that, yeah. I'm just wondering we should wait till 12 o'clock or so because when the morning session and 12 o'clock is 11 o'clock session and some people may come in. Hopefully. Um, sure, we can do that, but I, I wouldn't count on it. Like I wouldn't expect a lot of people to shop, partially because of how the schedule looks online. Yeah. Um, yes, there is. This is just like so it's on the recording, okay, you know. Sure, so, sure. so I, I don't have anything specific, but my workflow is primarily SQL, yeah. um, So I wonder if there's any recommendations, best practice, working with TypeScript using JS, and maybe like yes, <coughs> we we recently transitioned from. Yeslin to Yeslin, and that's another thing. I just wonder best practices and just, just general things that you know. Yeah. I think you know if you have run into, you have yeah. about. I don't. Know. Do you? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much insight onto the TypeScript. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I'm also like in the unfortunate position that I've never actually used TypeScript for anything, and I really wish we like. I personally would love to have that in Node Core at this point, because it would definitely have caught a few bugs early. Um, but yeah, I don't really think I like. <laughs> I mean, like so. So the thing is, like, if you run into issues that you know TypeScript has specifically with Node, then feel free to reach out to us. And like, uh, I would always be curious to see like how we can improve things for TypeScript users. But um, like, like Node itself, it it only kind of compiles whatever the user sends it. And in the TypeScript case, that's you know 
tra already transpile TypeScript. So usually it doesn't really affect us, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can still ask them. Um, so like it, the current streams API version is three, yes. Um, but like it may, I mean like they all exist at the same time. Like it's somewhere, somewhere backwards compatible. Um, streams one was basically just emitting events, like emitting data events on a stream. I think that was pretty much it. Like no internals in any way. Like whatever implemented that interface was streams. And streams two was like, the thing that actually most people use at this point, which is like having dot write and um, dot on data, but like with a lot of internal machinery that takes care of things like buffering and like converting strings and buffers, stuff like that. Um, and and streams three added like dot read, uh, which is kind kind of a different paradigm. Like it uh, allows doing pull streams instead of push streams. But I don't see many people using that in practice because that on data is still kind of very useful. Um, and there are some things being worked on. Um, like uh, Jeremiah Sankpil is working like at Fishrock123, is this handle? <laughs> and he's working, or he had been working on a, a replacement streams API that would kind of be more low level and have less overhead. Like one of the things that annoy that's annoying about Node.js core streams is that they do have some overhead um, that you know wouldn't be necessarily in a, in an ideal world, but the API kind of requires it at this point. And and what he's working on is kind of like trying to you know yeah be more low level and provide something nicer for people who want it. Yeah, that's Bob streams. Yeah. And, and I mean, like, there's also always the option of like eventually implementing what WG streams in a in node at some point. Um, yeah. Anything I, else? I, I'm not an SME in the streams, but my perspective, probably outsider's view to the streams, is that Node.js is possibly the first platform or language which has the streams implemented at the language API level itself which works yeah. well with the asynchronous event-driven programming model. Uh, other languages like C++ or Java, .NET, etc. will have this as an additional capability, not uh, fused into the SNI. So because of that, I mean, because of that, it's an added advantage, but the, the drawback is we don't have a specification around the life cycle events of the stream. Whether the close <laughs> should be called after the destroy, destroy should be called before the end. Those conversations are happening yeah. in an endless manner and that adds up to a bad user experience. So yeah. probably one of the thing we should be looking at is not necessarily a new implementation which outperforms the existing one. We should freeze on the spec or the protocol, what, what should be the life cycle event. And I guess Node.js is best place to come up with a spec on that than other languages. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's tricky. I, I, like you probably also have seen, like we have a collaborator, or not yet collaborator, but probably, hopefully soon, um, who did a lot of work around the streams over the last month. And like he opened so many issues on the Node core repo that were all about like, yeah, ordering of life cycle events or like, yeah, just like figuring out what the actual edge cases are, what the interactions of the different parts of streams are. Is there so many unanswered questions at this point with the current API? Yeah. I also like, I find it super interesting that there's this pattern that like a lot of Node.js features eventually end up being provided by browsers at some point, but like in a very different and kind of clearer manner. Um, like for example, buffers, which eventually became U and eight arrays and stuff like that, or string, no string decoder, which you know, browsers provide as text decoder now, a and streams. You know, I, I feel like what WG streams are a, a 
nicer, more like well-defined API. Okay. Yeah. Training or anything, so I'm here on my own. <laughs> um, after I get the session variables working, I don't have anything in there for security currently, so I don't know if any of you guys know the best way to proceed. I haven't even searched around to be honest. I just am looking for some early guidance on how to properly and ben most beneficially do that within my Node JS application. I mean, security is like a very big topic, right? Right. <laughs> so can you just explain the different types of security there is or the individual components if you say it's complex or it's large? Like a quick overview or is that too high level for this workshop? Yes, yeah, I have no, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at at high level, I would say that <laughs> Node.js web app. Being in the back end, being always serving services mm -hmm. is centrally located in terms of the security uh, vulnerabilities. But at the same time, when it comes to the security posture, we have to look at two aspects. One is what is the type of your application? Are you trusting everything that the program contains? For example, the, the program at high level would contain your application, the routes and mm. other things, and NPM modules, and the Node.js APIs itself, and the underlying system and kernel and things like that. This is the whole web app stack. Yeah. Now, what is the trust that is established between these uh, stack modules? Uh, there are, I, I guess there were huge discussions that happened in 2017, Node.js Interactive. Uh, should we trust the NPM modules or shouldn't be. If you don't trust the NPM modules, then we need to implement the security constraints right in the runtime itself. But if you if you trust the NPM modules, like put proper security audits and proper reviews and things like that, then uh, the default security constraints that is available in the runtime applies across the board all the node all the javascript modules come under the purview of that and then i mean then you just need to worry about the other uh, vulnerabilities which are uh, available in the networking session like the cross site scripting the session hijacking and things like that right. i guess the default behavior or the default implementation of all the express and its submodules have very good uh, security uh, coverage in terms of the web app uh, security okay. so that boils down to the runtime security alone in my opinion right okay. so the, the current current standpoint or the current way the node.js app works is taken for granted that the modules and pm modules and your own application and the Node.js API all work together in conjunction. There is no difference yeah. between uh, each of these things from the virtual machine perspective. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I, I guess um, you try to implement a whole security yeah. layer in between the APIs and the user modules. Yeah, but yeah, that didn't happen, or at least not yet. Anyway, like you mentioned something. Do you mind if I like? Yeah, sure. Please use. Uh, so. Uh, I, I'm gonna, uh, if I can find it, uh, pluck somebody else's talk here. 
um, uh, if I can find it online. Anyway, like I, I was at a conference like uh, earlier this year where there was a great talk about HTTP headers and how they affect security. Maybe they have a link to their YouTube channel here or something. Uh, if not, then not. I don't know. He, he was the dude they gave the talk. And okay, yeah, I don't know. Anyway. Um, okay, I, yeah. Anyway, like, there's a lot of HTTP headers that are concerned with things like security. Um, and like you, since you mentioned cross-site scripting, like if that is one of your concerns, then there's always, always measures that you can take to m mitigate this, like reduce the seriousness of this attack vector. And like, I don't know, there's probably good resources on the relevant HTTP headers out there too. Right. Oh, the HTTP headers? Maybe. Yeah, it, it might have been that. Yeah. But, but it also, like, it was a great talk, which is why I'm playing it. OK. Yeah, thanks. One other thing which I think the Express or any middleware component can improve on is to document the security implications of different usage of the modules. For example, if your application is not redirecting or not making use of the session, then the session hijacking is not coming into the picture. Maybe for uh, people who are well uh, understood in the art, it might become trivial. But for a new programmer or an application, uh, normal application programmer, these kinds of mapping really helps a lot. For example, what is the nature of your application? What are the kind of things you are doing? with respect to the client server or the web app transactions and what are the vulnerabilities that is uh, subjected for this type of transaction. That mapping would really help. Yeah, so I see a, I'm just on the node security page and it says that you can report third party module bugs to uh, the security working group repository, HackerOne. Yeah. So, Anybody ever had problems with uh, third-party node modules or or modules, third-party modules? I mean, not anybody in the world, but like in your guys' experience, anyone? I I mean, like I'm not seeing the the H1 reports for that, but I def I know that there have been reports, and right. and I mean, like I know that there have been like very public um, cases of of. NPM packages being yeah. used to do evil things. Mm -hmm. um, I, but it's the same with Python and the same with other repositories too. Right. So. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Should we call it a day? Yeah. My mic keeps falling off. So that might be a sign from the universe. <laughs> well, then, thank you all for coming. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and again, if there's anything else, like anything you need help with, then there's the Node.js slash help repository for that. And yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much. <laughs>